Hi everyone, today we are going to talk about activities of the international human rights and organization. Uh, my name is uh, Mikita Zhukov. Uh, I am a CEO of uh, legal firm Zhukov Legal Family Office, a co-founder of the Legal Design Project, chairman of the Ukrainian Bar Association Committee on Constitutional Law, Administrative Law and Human Rights, coordinator of uh, Ukrainian Bar Association Young Lawyers Forum. And uh, the speaker of today's meeting is James Douglas. James Douglas is a public international lawyer with over eight years of experience in international criminal and international human rights law. He currently serves as executive director for Irish Rule of Law International, where he oversees projects relating to access to justice and transitional justice across many different jurisdictions. In addition, he acts as a legal advisor to Victim Advocates International, where he assists Rohingya groups engage with different accountability uh, mechanism. From 2013 to 2018, he served as a lawyer and investigator with the United Nations Hemer Roach Tribunal, where he worked to the office of the co-investigation judge. He also pro previously held position with OHCHR and Acutable Cambodia. In the focus of today's even event, uh, mission and activities of International Rule of Law Organization, cases with a video demonstration of the work of the organization, requirements for joining an international organization, exchange of experience in the field of the rule of law. So James Douglas, you have a floor, let's get started. Thanks. Thank you, Megida, for the introduction. Uh, it's really nice to be here today to address you all um, as part of Irish Rule of Law International. Um, as uh, Megida alluded to earlier, I am the currently the Executive Director for Irish Rule of Law International, and we run a variety of programs. Um, so the one that is perhaps the most emblematic of our entire work is our project that we have in Malawi, uh, which is an access to justice program. So we have a lawyer who works with uh, different criminal justice institutions in Malawi. We have a lawyer who works with the police, with the prosecutor, with the judiciary, and with the legal aid bureau. And we also have a social worker who works with children to assist them in diverting children away from the criminal justice system. So we have been running this uh, operation for 10 years. And in order for you to give an overview of what this program looks like and our day-to-day -day activities, uh, I'm going to show you a video. Uh, sorry, James, I think that we have some trouble with sound because uh, I don't hear, hear anything. No. You don't hear it, but you can see it, but you can't hear anything. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, I don't know how to do... I mean, the volume on my computer is up. One second. <laughs> Let me just try to take my headphones off. Okay. The, does this work? Pendimene, Moyanga, Unari, 
So there are approximately about 15,000 prisoners uh, in Malawi, and there are huge delays uh, in the, an awful lot of those cases going to court. Also, prisoners can't afford a lawyer in many cases. So because of that, the, uh, there's a, a huge burden is placed on the Legal Aid Bureau. So they have limited capacity and they can't possibly provide legal representation to all, all suspects who are in prison. So that, that's our role really is, is to provide support there for unrepresented accused. Most of the people who are in prison, 90% uh, are poor, uh, illiterate. So uh, there's need uh, for uh, people like paralegals to give them legal advice, legal education, so that legal empowerment, so that they can represent themselves. So the law in Malawi says that no child should be. Uh, uh, imprisoned for any offence. But unfortunately, in reality, uh, you will find that a lot of children are held in police custody, a lot of children are held in prisons as well. I think something that sticks out to me is mostly when you're dealing with street children. So you will find that um, most, most police officers say, oh no, these kids are thieves or you know they're vagrants so then they get arrested and then you put them in jail for two days or so now Malawi and jails you need food so what do you think is going to happen to those ch that child they're going to be abused by the older male prisoners like sexual exchanging sexual favors for food is a reality for street kids interesting in the program we also interact with the parents for the children so we're, we're also visiting their homes. We're trying to, to use a holistic approach to trying to work on helping them so that they can be able to understand where things went wrong in their life. I'm a traumatized victim or I have a disability and then I'm a victim of rape what you hear people say is oh but then you couldn't have been raped you should just be grateful someone found you attractive but that's because you have disabilities so that's another layer of victimization and there have, I've seen cases where even the parents of the person with disabilities are like oh no but we're just happy that now she has a boyfriend you know now you know she has a baby we never thought she would have a baby but that's defeating the purpose like it's the fact that she didn't consent from my perspective, I think a lot of the issues in 
uh, justice, maybe even on this continent, are to do with colonialism and post-colonialism. With, as Irish rule of law, we try and take our direction from the people here. We don't try and impose answers. We are solution-driven, but it has to come from Malawians themselves. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Everything is yeah. okay. Everything's good. Thank you. So that uh, that was um, just um, one of our one of our flagship programs in Malawi, um, and I, I want that's I just want to introduce that that but that is just a part of IRLI's work. So now I'm going to kind of give you a more um, in detail um, kind of background to our history, how we ended up in Malawi, uh, and other projects we run that are like Malawi. So I'm going to uh, run us all through a PowerPoint presentation. Can, is, can everyone see that? Yeah. Thank you. So what does it so what is irish rule of law so first of all we're a project oriented rule of law ish initiative so project means that we tend to we uh, we don't do these one off interventions but we run full on projects that are in country so as you saw in the case of malawi um we actually hire lawyers from Ireland and in malawi to work within individual criminal justice institutions with the overall goal of um, capacity building with the ultimate aim of decongest decongesting Malawi's prisons. Um, so Irish rule of law, we are the charitable arm of the legal professions on uh, the island of Ireland. That means we're basically the charity for the Law Society, which is the legal body for solicitors in Ireland, and the Bar of Ireland, which is the um, legal profession for barristers and in 2015 uh, we were joined by the legal professions in Northern Ireland so that means we are currently run across two jurisdictions the jurisdiction in the Republic of Ireland and the jurisdiction in Northern Ireland so all of our programs we try to encourage and facilitate collaboration between members of the legal professions in both jurisdictions. That's very key to our work is um, this idea of cooperation with our partners in the north. So our mission is a statement. So basically, what is it that we do? We harness the expertise and knowledge within the legal professions, both in Ireland and internationally to provide pro bono legal support, advice and technical assistance to legal capacity and institute building in resource restrained countries. So basically we work with um, the best international and Irish lawyers and uh, we build capacities and develop legal systems in other jurisdictions with the overall goal of promoting human rights. So some of our um, our key values are, and this is taken directly from our um, mission statement. Um, IRLI is guided by all of these values. Um, all, um, integrity. Uh, we have strong moral and ethical principles, and we in, try to instill this everywhere we work in partner countries. Uh, promotion of human rights. So ultimately, how we define rule of law at Irish in Rule of Law International is the idea of accountability. So everyone in power is subject to international recognized human rights laws, and uh, and no, and uh, each person is equal before the eyes of the law. Uh, respect. Um, we work within our organization to respect everyone based on their cultural, religious, and social differences. And we also promote this in our external relations. We are accountable and transparent to our employees, our partners, and our donors. 
and as an NGO, even though we receive a lot of our funding from the Irish government, we are completely independent of them. So we're able to speak out on issues that might not be in line with what our government says because we're independent. Um, and also what's at the core of our work, you'll see that we run projects, but we don't want to just have a project and then leave a country and leave a vacuum whereby uh, those services are no longer available. So we try to strive to build local capacity so that our project can continue on even when we're not there. Okay, so the origins of Irish rule of law started out as very small little projects and then they grew in time uh, when we came to Malawi. So basically what would happen at the beginning of Irish rule of law international is that certain countries or governments would ask Ireland for their expertise on certain legal issues. And as we were the charitable arm, we had access to both solicitors and barristers who had all of this expertise and whom we could uh, recommend to participate and take an initiative in these projects. So the first ever project we ran was in 2007 in Kosovo. And it, this was upon when Kosovo was looking to establish an an independent professional body, such as the Law Society or the Ukrainian Bar Association so uh, for its lawyers. So we developed a legal training program and we also put in place protocols to ensure over time that there was enhanced uh, equality and representation of women and minorities um, in, within the legal profession. Then in, um, from 2013 to 2018, uh, we worked with universities in Myanmar and Vietnam to assist them with, kind of, with clinical legal education. Uh, so we organized mock trials for students to uh, work on certain human rights issues, which gave them an opportunity to practice, practice their oral and advocacy skills. Then in Zambia, we uh, worked on a project on legal, legal education, but also to assist judicial assistants and clerks with, uh, with judgment writing. So this was like a, a legal writing course. Um, and then in Ethiopia, we had a five day training to 80 plus judges and prosecutors. Uh, and this took place over the next three years, but they were very short trainings, five days at a time. Then in over this eight year period in Kenya, we worked on uh, after the violence of the 2007 election, uh, we, uh, we, a number of our lawyers and barristers uh, presented to the International Bar Association a human rights assessment of the violence that happened after 20, 2007 and made recommendations on uh, the ju justice needs to respond to the electoral violence in 2007. We published this in 2010. And then in Bosnia and Herzegovina, we worked we um, worked on specific rules uh, on the operation of a court. So as you see at the beginning, the work didn't seem seem really technical. We were just getting lawyers to kind of assist with very distinct um, areas of their expertise, but we didn't have anything like a kind of a full project. So you'll see that we grew quite a lot in this period. So I'm gonna go through um, last year and you, you'll see kind of the different, how we've grown and, and the different type of projects that we're running. So how, are we, how, how have we been seen in, in the community? We, we tend to do our work through uh, community outreach. We speak at universities to law students and we also speak to legal professionals at uh, younger stages. Uh, we, we provide uh, legal 
internships and fellowships for legal trainees with law firms and we support um, big law firms in Ireland who give their trainees pro bono work. So we give them sampling of human rights work. And we also have kind of delivered lectures abroad. Um, we also run a series of speaker events in, in the Republic of Ireland in, in Black Hole Place. Uh, for instance, earlier this year, we ran a conference on apartheid in uh, Israel and Palestine, where we invited members of Israeli and Palestinian civil society um, to speak to an audience of lawyers. Uh, we've also, um, in Malawi, we've also run seminars on torture uh, and forced confessions. So for instance, in Malawi, there's a provision in the criminal, in the criminal code that, uh, that allows forced confessions to be admissible in, uh, in court. So we have kind of run a seminar on the status of forced confessions in line with international human rights law, even whether they amount to, to torture, but also uh, insofar as it is evidence that should not be admissible, that goes against fair trial rights standards. Um, we also held a seminar on, on other diverse topics such as climate change um, and the role of interstate uh, arbitration in addressing climate issues. We, um, we played a big role in planning the PILMET 2022 conference in Ireland which saw over 400 lawyers and members of civil society come to Dublin to speak about the pro projects that they had ongoing between um, civil society organizations and lawyers in big law firms uh, who were exercising their pro bono pledge. Uh, in addition, last year, our executive director, Angus Kelly, uh, went to Tanzania to present on a two-day seminar to members of the police and judiciary in Tanzania on the best way and lessons learned in Ireland on investigating, prosecuting, and adjudicating child sexual abuse. Also, every two years, every year, we hold a criminal law and evidence conference in which we have eight speakers present on a paper of an issue that is topical in criminal law uh, and we do the same with commercial law and all of the proceeds from these kind of events goes to uh, goes to our running our programs so last year we had a very successful year and we were awarded the uh, pro bono community law firm of the year um, by the irish uh, legal awards uh, we're a small country so that's not as impressive as it might be in Ukraine, but we were we were very we were very happy with it. So, how do you how who who works with IRLI? And I guess this is kind of alludes goes to the earlier question uh, when you you were asking me how does one get a job in uh, international human rights work? So the vast majority of people who we work with are, are naturally lawyers who have some degree of human rights experience. But with human rights law, it's not just, uh, it's not just about the legal issues that are important, but also you need people with um, project management skills and specific development expertise, which is a language that's, which can be quite alien to um, lawyers such as yourselves. So we frequently have to learn um, new language and new skills uh, in, order to, in order to be able to speak to donors and, or, and in order to be able to measure the impact of our projects. So I wanna understand rule of law is not just about law or being a lawyer, it's more about the system, how the system can uh, tolerate with different caseloads. So the, the solution in a specific context might not be to get better laws or better lawyers. For instance, in Malawi, they have amazing laws and they have great lawyers, but they have a lack of resources. So sometimes the most effective form of intervention could be 
something as simple as implementing a filing system or a, a case management system so that they can track files. Or another thing that we work on Malawi is, um, is that judges don't have access to precedent. So it's a common law system in Malawi. They don't have access to the case law. So we assist in publishing the case law on online and also we develop these um, we do these pamphlets and handouts uh, so that the lawyers can can see uh, the relevant case law and don't need to spend too long looking for it. Um, and we're not all lawyers. So one of our projects in Malawi is it's called Maiwasan Tika, which is a Malawian word for uh, child diversion. In, so under if a, if a child, someone who is under 18 is is caught uh, doing a, a non-violent offense such as um, such as stealing a phone or something, then there is an option to instead of sending the child to jail that they can they can uh, do this uh, program whereby they are uh, given kind of skills, to reintegrate into society and the idea is that once that they attend this they'll go back into the community and they won't want to reoffend. so we run this every year uh, and it has a really good success uh, usually the the participants don't tend to reoffend. so there were lawyers and uh, development program expertise but we also are looking uh, at like sociological issues. So we have social workers. So there's a kind of a diverse kind of skill set uh, we cater to uh, in our work. Okay, so I'm not going to go through all of this, but um, I've these are um, are the partnerships that we forged with, um, the, as I've pointed to, we're primarily funded by the Irish government, but we get support from the legal professions. And we also work with law firms in, in they assist us by giving us uh, either lawyers who can give us advice over something like employment law internally, or they work on kind of bigger uh, programs. So la last year, for instance, we worked on a human rights defenders program in Southeast Asia. And we were given these cases of people who had been arbitrarily detained. So we presented briefs and did legal research that were filed before the United Nations Working Group on arbitrary detention. So we're a project oriented uh, rule of law organization who is uh, the charitable arm of the legal professions of Ireland. But we do more than just uh, run our projects in Malawi. We also do some work in Ireland. So uh, um, as you probably aware, we're a founding member of the Ukraine-Ireland Legal Alliance. But before Russia's invasion of Ukraine, uh, we were also involved, involved in uh, Afghanistan. Uh, we. Um, when the Taliban took over last year, we worked with the International Association of Women Judges, and we put pressure on the Irish government to uh, accept women, women judges who were fleeing the Taliban. So all of these 10 women judges had presided over cases, criminal cases, uh, that included the Taliban as accused persons. So mm -hmm. since, they, since that happened, uh, we have been trying to support them as they resettle in Ireland. This has been involved anything from getting housing, but now we're at a stage where we're organizing educational opportunities and further professional development so that they can use their legal skills in Ireland. There, and then our next project, as you've seen in the video, is Malawi, which is a 10 year old project and over the course of 10 years uh, over 2500 prisoners have received legal services 
So the objectives are to build capacities within the uh, individual institutions into which the lawyers are seconded, uh, to enhance access to justice for vulnerable, unrepresented accused persons. So that primarily involves with people who are sent, are charged of a crime, but who cannot afford a lawyer. Or we also work on access to justice for victims of crimes by setting up uh, legal clinics in remote areas so people can have access to information on how they file a, an individual claim. Uh, as we pointed to earlier, Malawi's prisons are over 260% over capacity. So we do everything in our power to try and get that number down because uh, the, the prison conditions themselves have been said to be inhuman and degrading treatments. So th this is kind of an, an example of, of the sort of achievements we accomplish in one year. So we last year, we assisted 134 children. Uh, 80 were granted bail, meaning that they were um, given conditional release uh, um, while awaiting trial. 35 children were diverted through the uh, Maiwas and Tika program, and 19 were discharged. So that's quite a big success rate in, in terms of, you know, keeping 134 children out of prison. Um, so we also uh, facilitated 12 camp courts, which reached 415 prisoners. So it, it, does anyone, a, a camp court is this idea, it's basically a mobile court. Because of the resourcing issues in Malawi, it's not possible to have uh, a judge preside over multiple cases in, in, in a court. So we bring the judges to the prison and, it's, and, and the hearings are, uh, take place there. So with, uh, in uh, last year, we managed to reach 415 people through these camp courts. Um, and then there was 10 children who graduated from the My Wasantika Child Diversion Program. Another thing that you need to bear in mind as well was last year was COVID. So there was a lot of kind of um, restrictions on our activities, specifically with our My Watson Tika program, because that involves large gatherings of children and adults. Uh, so it was very difficult to, to, to continue this program while uh, under the restrictions of COVID, which is why there were a, a less people reached last year than, than previous before. So another way in which last year we managed to, uh, to, to decongest Malawi's prisons is through a process of judicial review, which is um, a lot of the cases which happen in Malawi are done at the magistrate level, lower level courts, and they're done by lay magistrates who have very little legal training. So judicial review is having is this process whereby you have a superior judge review the decision of a magistrate, and uh, this, this, through this procedure, we managed to secure the release of 114 plus prisoners. Uh, we also do a lot of advocacy at the United Nations level. So uh, as you're aware, probably there is the UN treaty and charter bodies. So we drafted alongside our local partners, the stakeholder submission before the Committee Against Torture. Uh, and the United Nations Human Rights Committee, as well as the Universal Periodic Review. Uh, we've also uh, engaged with the African Court of Human and People's Rights. Uh, we do a lot of advocacy at the local level as well. So uh, we, we work on advocating for um, progressive criminal justice reform, where laws that are archaic need to be repealed. Um, we've done a lot of advocacy around laws that uh, criminalize vagrancy, for instance, um, and um, the death penalty. So we're currently in, in Malawi, the death penalty exists. There's been a moratorium on it for a number of years now, but in, in, in relation to a number of killings, um, Malawi is constantly in the in the press because of people with albinism are frequently uh, targeted and murdered 
So kind of a knee jerk reaction for this was to respond to this was by the judges started um, re-instituting and resentencing people to death. So we've been doing a lot of um, advocacy trying to get um, the death penalty repealed in the library. Okay, so you've kind of seen all, uh, all of these kind of statistics throughout the videos. Before I continue, uh, I just want to ask is, does anyone maybe have any comments or questions about Malawi or Afghanistan or how, uh, or, or kind of how, how we're structured? So okay, if there's not, uh, I'll just proceed and there'll be more opportunities to have a kind of a discussion at the end. Okay, so another project that we've just started is one in Somalia. So and Ireland has a lot of experience with conflict itself, specifically recent conflict in the North. So Ireland has this, uh, expertise in what we call transitional justice and um, and this is a type of expertise that communities in the north gathered uh, because there was no state account there was no accountability or buy-in for accountability by the state so these are these are kind of uh, informal justice mechanisms that that exist outside of the court system so uh, in a in in Somalia, we've we've just have this flagship project where we're um, we're trying to find uh, victim communities who want to be part around a part of discussions around truth and reconciliation in Somalia, just like in Northern Ireland. So we are hoping that we can bring the expertise of Northern Irish criminal justice actors into Somalia and help them organize and engage in these truth-telling um, consultations. So basically this would involve identifying a group of victims who, who want to be part of these discussions and assisting them in organizing, uh, providing them with access to legal resources, legal re representation and advocacy support. So the, the, it will be up for these victim groups to kind of decide what justice might look for them. That might be that justice is more criminal or uh, restorative type of justice, or it might be a type of justice that's more geared towards healing uh, that doesn't involve uh, prosecution. It also helps to assist with survivors um, to, 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 to rebuild themselves within the community and for communities to have difficult conversations about, about what happened during the conflict uh, so, that they can, so that they can build on this and uh, reintegrate. Um, so, and then, so we'll have um, members of Ireland go to Somalia and, and present on how this was done in Ireland, how members of communities took it within their own hands to to have some sort of truth telling initiative and uh, reconciliation. So this is actually our, our oldest program and it's a little bit less interesting than the other ones, um, I think because it's uh, no offense to anyone who does um, commercial law, but it's, uh, it's a commercial law training that we do. It, and it, it evolves in at the back of uh, post apartheid in South Africa. So the idea of this project was that there would be commercial law trainings would be delivered to through the Law Society of South Africa uh, to members of uh, the most marginalized communities within South Africa. Um, and so it was basically, it sounds like it's a big kind of commercial cause, but it was, it was like, it was very practical kind of legal skills that you would need in very remote areas, like how you would set up a, an association or a company uh, for running a shop, kind of tax issues, how to draft a contract, like very kind of 
practical legal issues. So we've been running this program um, since 2012. Doesn't strictly have a human rights component, but it does, as you saw in our mission statement, we all, also one of the goals for ILI is to kind of to address inequality. So, so this is how we do it by, by, by targeting communities from underprivileged backgrounds and trying to upskill them. So we have another project in, in, in Tanzania, which is, uh, which is very focused on the victim side. As you saw in, in Malawi, a lot of the work that we did was with prisoners and with those who were in detention. Whereas in Tanzania, we, um, we work with um, victims of child sex abuse to assist them in accessing justice. And how do we do this? Uh, through uh, working with members of the judiciary, the prosecution and the police, anyone who's involved in prosecuting or adjudicating child sexual abuse cases um, and training them in the best practices. So this is another area why Ireland has a specific expertise. Uh, Ireland was, uh, had a lot of child sexual abuse uh, that happened at the hands of the Catholic Church and there was decades of under-reporting. So even though it was very commonplace, child sexual abuse was happening in Ireland, there was no one, no one felt safe to report it until the 1990s. So you had all of these historical cases coming before members of the Irish judiciary, the police and the prosecution, and they were kind of seeing it for the first time. So, so Tanzania has a very similar project problem, even though it is estimated that one in six uh, uh, girls will, will experience some degree of um, inappropriate sexual behavior, there is, um, it, there is a huge endemic problem with underreporting. So, this is, we, we really went in to, with a local partner and uh, we kind of targeted people at the community level and we tried to raise their awareness of the available mechanisms that existed to report child sexual abuse cases. And then we also kind of worked on very practical issues. You know, you might, you might like when you're, when you're trying to establish why people don't report things to the police, you might establish that there is a mistrust of the police, that people kind of perceive the police as being corrupt. So they would rather take justice within their own hands. So it was also kind of working with those perceptions and also work communicating this to the criminal justice actors. Uh, other things that might prevent a case reaching trial is there's a lack of cooperation between the police and the prosecution or there is the communication is just shut down so often you'll find that it's um it's a very practical kind of solution to enhance kind of rule of rule of law in in in, in our specific projects so we we held 15 awareness sessions so these basically we get you go into the communities and you get them to sit down in a, in a round table and you kind of discuss them with them you know you kind of establish what what their current knowledge is of the mechanisms and then at the end of the at the end of the um the, the session you, you kind of test how their knowledge has increased so but like there, in in the, in these kind of cases, you'll see that um, a lot of people don't really have an understanding of how the criminal justice uh, process works. A lot of victims of gender-based violence and child sexual abuse don't even understand, might not even understand that they were victims of a crime uh, because they normalized it or it was committed by a close family member. So they. Um, they just think that it's normal and it's not actually something wrong. Um, and then often they don't really understand their role in how they're supposed to report it. Like also uh, the parents have a duty to report if something happened to their child and how to collect evidence uh, um, with the police. So there's um, obviously there is the um, testimonial evidence, but there's a lot of physical evidence that needs to be in place for a successful um, 
child sexual abuse case. So, uh, so we ran these community sensitizations, awareness trainings, and we reached uh, over 4,000 people. Most of them were students who were under the age of 18. And also these were, uh, we deliver these trainings to police, judiciary, and prosecutors as well, so that they would know. A lot of a lot of the also the issues that we would have dealt with were how how a police person would take evidence from a child uh, with very practical measures, how to interview someone who's vulnerable and prone to re-traumatization to ensure that you don't re-traumatize them. Uh, and again, we work within the legal system. So uh, there's often for, for cases in, involving neglect, abuse, and gender-based violence, there's social workers involved. So we also work with the social workers. Um, we work with uh, them to provide psychosocial, psychosocial support, counseling to, to children who have experienced such trauma. Um, at the end of the program, we, 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 uh, we had a conference and we had all of the highest members of the Tanzanian judiciary and police from the from the central region come and, and discuss like what can be done at a policy level to ensure that the lessons that we were kind of distilling at the local level were being uh, legislated for. So in actually in three weeks time, met four Tanzanian judges are going to visit Ireland and they're going to be given a tour of our four courts but also given kind of uh, advanced um, training or awareness of technical expertise for people from people who have spent their careers um, prosecuting or adjudicating these types of cases. Uh, so that will happen in two weeks they, and the judges will go to the Republic and to the uh, North. Uh, we just started a new project in Zambia as well um, this year and it's very similar. We're trying to, we're continuously asked to kind of build on the expertise that we're already, we've already acquired uh, through our Malawi program. So Zambia has a very similar issue uh, as in Malawi with prison overcrowding and also a high number of children who are in conflict with the law. So I, I, sp I spoke to you earlier about how in Malawi we have these things called camp courts, which are these uh, mobile courts which physically come, to, which make their way to the prison um, and where, um, where paralegals are given right of audience uh, and uh, judges have the, judges can issue bail. Uh, and this is a really effective mechanism for decongesting prisons. So Zambia doesn't have anything similar. So we're now kind of piloting and showing Zambia how our, how these camp courts work in Malawi, hoping that they will be interested in, in bringing the same system in Zambia so that we can continue our work on decongesting um, prisons there. Uh, also, there, there's been, there's a lot of corruption in Zambia and we have kind of been asked specifically through the embassy to identify uh, Irish lawyers, police and prosecutors and judges who have investigated, prosecuted or adjudicated financial crimes. So we're currently engaging with like the criminal assets bureaus in Ireland and Northern Ireland and uh, trying to set up kind of rules of procedure for this specific division of the high court um to so that they so when they get this rolling that they'll be able to kind of build on a lot of the expertise are we have developed on the island uh through through seizing assets and investigating them and um, we've also been asked to do something similar in malawi um we have another kind of components to our zambia project which is uh which is which is actually technically separate and is is supported by the UK government. And this is uh, very similar in Malawi. We have uh, a legal provision which provides for the possibility of child diversion uh, for, for certain offenses. So there's no, such, there's no such provision in Zambian law. 
So the whole idea is uh, is to discretionary alternatives, working with prosecutors who can who can use their discretion to 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 um, promote or to suggest alternatives other than sending um, children to bail, uh, expanding the use of bail to other uh, crimes, and then also um, kind of community support uh, to prevent children from uh, from coming in conflict with the law. So we're co continuously building on our work in Malawi in, in like in different contexts. Although the different the, the legal regimes are always different, there's like some kind of commonalities. So Zambia is very new. We've just started the program three months. We've already had our um, our lawyers from Malawi visit and speak to actors within the criminal justice system there about how camp courts worked. And the idea is that hopefully this is a this is something that they would like to also adopt in Zambia. Additional focus. Okay, so they're, they're the projects that we've run. So we, we were, we're working with the Afghanistan program and then we have, have four specific access to justice programs in uh, sub-Saharan Africa. We're also running this transitional justice initiative in Somalia. And last year, we, we assisted an organization called Destination Justice with uh, detained activists across Southeast Asia. So like this was engaging with the United Nations Working Group on Arbitrary Detention. Um, so we, we, we engage a lot with these kind of UN mechanisms as well. We also worked with Rohingya groups uh, to uh, advocate against the use of hate speech, which was being amplified through algorithms on Facebook. So in last year, um, a number of Rohingya filed a complaint in Ireland before the OECD uh, national contact point. We provided advocacy support to the Rohingya to access justice through this means. Um, and another other kind of um, places where we take advocacy was the, obviously in relation to Ukraine, we have been very vocal. Um, against the illegal invasion. Um, we have spoken out against um, settlement building uh, in Palestine and Israeli raids on Palestinian NGOs, the persecution of the Uyghur uh, in China. We speak out on a number of kind of human rights issues and we have come people speak to these issues in Ireland. So the idea is that maybe we can get a You'll, you'll probably see that members of the legal professions in Ireland, they can issue statements uh, rebuking a certain act that is unlawful. So the Law Society of Ireland issued a statement uh, after uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, condemning it. So we try to, 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 to gauge these reactions from the legal professions and get a kind of common uh, response. Uh, we also, another one of our target areas is in environment, environmental law, business and human rights. So last year we hired a, a senior research fellow in sustainability, energy and climate change. Uh, we, we haven't really done much on environmental law other than we've, we've held some seminars on arbitration. Uh, we are also hoping to kind of support some of the NGOs within Within our uh, network, who who are who are litigating against big polluters, um, so that's that's an area in which we would like to get involved in in the future, but we're we're not currently there. Um, and we work a, a little bit in business and human rights. I explained earlier how we kind of provided assistance and advocacy support to uh, Rohingya groups who were trying to. Um, to seek justice against Facebook in Ireland, so. I'm not sure if you're aware, but Facebook Ireland, Facebook Ireland is the international headquarters for a lot of social media companies, um, such as Facebook, Twitter, and uh, Google, um, Amazon. A lot of European or international headquarters are based there. So business and human rights is, is definitely a big area where we would like further involvement. And 
on Ukraine. So we are a founding member of the Ukraine Ireland Legal Alliance. I'm not sure to the extent of which you are aware of our work, but uh, the the Legal Alliance is is set up to assist Ukrainians who are in Ireland to navigate um, the social welfare system, to find housing, education, uh, professional support, and we're also uh, taking playing a role in in ensuring Ireland takes a response to ensure that uh, Russia is held accountable. So I'm not sure if you all saw, and not that we had anything to do with this, but Ireland intervened as a third party uh, in the ICJ case that Ukraine took against Russia uh, in support of it. Um, and we're kind of pushing towards uh, other kind of actions that can be done um, my my background, as you are aware of, is I work with uh, victims of international crimes. So there's also a discussion of whether or not, you know, there, there there may be some scope for increased engagement with the ICC ICJ case or with the universe or with the the cases that are ongoing in Ukraine um, through the through those who are who are present in Ireland. Um, so at the moment, we're kind of assisting people to, to share evidence through the portals. Um, and Angus, um, who I replaced temporarily, has obviously been seconded by the European Union and is currently in Kiev working as a special advisor to the, the prosecutor general. Um, so he's on leave for a period of six months in which case, in case I have taken over temporarily. Um, but we're continuing on with with the work with the Ukraine Ireland Legal Alliance. Um, we meet every Tuesday, and our programs are are all expanding. Um, so as you see at the beginning, we were just doing these kind of little trainings that were were a week long, where we would send some lawyers to um, to Kenya to assist in some trainings, and now we have kind of fully. Um, fledged programs that are actually in on the ground so we we have a lot of kind of traction and pull and as you see from the Malawi program um, it's quite effective and we get we get quite a quite a lot of results 